all about video streaming. It's definitely the, one of the more challenging tech things that's happening right now in, in the church market. But so Excel AV Group, just real briefly, we do acoustics, sound video, and lighting systems. Um, it was very fortunate that we worked with Lord of Life last year. And at the end of this, if you'd like to go upstairs in the sanctuary and view their video wall, it's breathtaking. I don't know if you saw it on the way in, you may not have. It's incredible. They have, just like this church here in uh, Fargo, this is a 16 foot wide video wall in a very bright room. You can see there's skylights, there's big windows everywhere. This church is even worse. It has two giant bay, bay windows on the uh, on the north and south side and so we would bring in projectors to Lord of Life um, like 10,000 lumen projectors and then we'd go wow <laughs> that looks really bad and um, I d we did this project in Fargo and I was talking with um, Lord of Life here and I said you have to see this technology and so they were like this looks like a, a real candidate and you know this is the year 2014, 2015, when I started talking with them, and they had never done projection. And how many churches have been doing projection for a long, long time? Because they just couldn't. So uh, long story short, is we did bring a demo in for them to look at a, a much smaller video wall. And then we installed it last year. It's incredible. They, any lighting condition up there, it doesn't matter at all. So. Anyways, uh, at, at the end of that, if you'd like to take a look, it's, it's running upstairs and one of, one of my guys will answer any questions on it. So let's jump right into this. Um, why stream? Streaming is not just live streaming. And that's really an important point that I want to talk about today is most of the people that watch your church's stream are going to be watching it on your archive channel, not so much live. And that's a really important point to make when it comes to introducing this idea to your church is to say, okay, is, it isn't just the live stream that is the real opportunity here, okay? And I'll talk about the pastor's fear of people not coming to church and watching, you know, the video in their bathrobe. I'll talk about that. And we'll, we'll address that, but um, it's in, in all reality, it's a really safe way to introduce your church to new people. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons. And that's fulfilling, you know, the Great Commission, Acts 1-8. Um, it is an unlimited outreach anywhere at any time. Again, keeping with the idea of the archive channel, and I'll show you examples of that later, or using it in the with the concept of a satellite campus or a satellite room. Um, most of the time that we've done streaming integration and video cameras and so forth in spaces, we're typically always giving the option to send that video to other parts of the building too. Because why would I buy all this camera technology and switching and audio and so forth and not also send it to other parts of the building, nursery, uh, cry rooms, uh, overflows, one of the biggest problems, of course, is Christmas and Easter with a lot of churches and the crazy spikes in uh, attendance. And then you have to put people in hallways and in lobbies and in other rooms. Well, this is a way for you to, to get that problem taken care of as well. Um, special events, you know, let's say that your, your child's grandmother lives in another state and really would like to be a part of the children's Christmas program. Well, this is a wonderful way that that can happen. So there's so many different ways to do it. Um, then there's the whole category of the shut-in um, and people that can't make it to church anymore. Uh, the statistic from the Barna Group, which does a lot of church research, is that 10% of your congregation is not attending for some reason or another kid is sick, they're out of town for work, family emergency, whatever. That's the typical statistic though. It's 10% of your congregation is not going to be able to make it to church for one reason or another. So that means that 10% of your church could take advantage of your live stream or your archive channel. 
Um, I'd, I didn't know this, but I was speaking with uh, Worship Channel's Sean West the other day, and we were discussing different topics with, with respect to streaming, and he told me that statistically, with this younger generation, age 20 to 34, especially young couples, they will check you out online an average of six times be before crossing the great threshold and opening the door and walking in. That's amazing. This is the category of people that have never gone to your church before. They don't have a relative that goes to your church. They just maybe moved into your community. But they will check you out online six times before walking in on average. That's amazing. So these are all reasons why to stream. So I'm going to get into the technical side now of streaming and how it works. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to circle around back to some of the practical questions and issues and so forth. So basically what streaming is, the basics is capturing video and audio, mixing it, encoding it, and uploading it to the internet. Uh, rules of thumb that, that I have always been a proponent of when it comes to video, and this is way back when we would just set up video systems for cable access, let alone streaming. More than one camera position. The reason that you want more than one camera position is that video in general gets to be really boring if it's just one camera shot. So if you think about it, uh, the reason that on a newscast we have sort of that main camera and then a camera right next to it, even though they're, they're literally almost in the same position, we're very used to going between at least two cameras at one time. If you just have one, it's fine if you start out that way, but it, it gets to be really boring quickly. Another, another thing about camera position, while I'm on my soapbox on this, please don't put your camera in a balcony and l make it look like Super America convenience store camera going down. My rule of thumb is plane of view. So if that means that you have a three foot high stage, your camera needs to be three foot up the waist up of a person standing on stage. So let's say eight feet off the floor. That's where that camera is going to be a level plane. That's your best position for a camera. The worst is coming down from a balcony. Another rule of thumb is, is good audio. And this is an area where a lot of churches, and I'm going to show you some examples later, really make a lot of mistakes in is the audio. I always think that audio and video, it doesn't matter if it's a video segment, something on YouTube, a music video, whatever. It always seems to me, movies, great example, it always seems to me that the soundtrack or the sound moves the video along. And that's a concept that I want you to think about when you watch your next thing online, whether it's a church service or whatever, is the audio moves the, the entire thing along and if you mute it, it's, it becomes almost non-existent. So with respect to that, the worst thing you could do is to take, for example, a lapel mic or an over-the-ear mic for your pastor, dry, straight onto your recording, and no ambient mic in the room whatsoever. The reason that we want an ambient mic is because we want to give the viewer the experience that, hey, I'm I feel like I'm there. When you're in this room with me, you hear the sound of the room also. You don't just hear my dry microphone. And it's really easy when you've, to pick this out if you watch a stream that is, has a dry mic going in without any ambient mic. So that's another one. Another thing is really good lighting is extremely important. I'll explain how that works in a minute. Another thing that I think is a real pitfall with streaming is to not have the name of the church the pastor, church logo, you know, the location of the church coming up or on the stream. Because, again, people will drive by your church literally hundreds of times wondering what goes on in there. They go to your website, hopefully you, they watch a video and they see what goes on, on the, in there. But wouldn't it be neat to have the pastor's name 
maybe the name of the sermon or whatever come up on that lower third. Lighting rules of thumb. Um, Three-point lighting is the key. So this is an area where we see a lot of people really, really struggling with is, is lighting. And the best way I can describe what three-point lighting is is to, sh is to kind of use my hands. So here would be my key light, which would be coming in like this. My fill light would be coming in like this. And then my, my back lighting would be coming from behind. And when all those are working in the proper position, you get really good lighting. Cameras need good light to work. It's the biggest thing. So 50 to 75 foot candles is, is a rule of thumb I carry around in my bag when I go to uh, on appointments and I review people's lighting and I review people's video and so forth. I carry around a little light meter and get them for about $75. And it's got a little white cup and you hold it up and it, and it reads actually how much lighting is in a room. And you can look at it this way, you can hold it up this way. And again, with, with proper lighting, try to keep in mind 45 degrees, key light, fill light, and backlight. The other, the other rule of thumb, I don't have it on my bullet point here though, is that your, your foreground, I'm sorry, your background behind you needs to be half of what your, your lighting is. So if you're lighting your pastor at 50 foot candles, the backdrop behind him needs to be at 25. Okay, that's the rule of thumb. And that comes from the old TV days. So the other thing with lights is color temperature and lights really vary. So incandescent tend to be a little bit more yellow. Now that we're in the world of LED and actual stage fixtures, we were able to control and get, they're called variable white fixtures, we're able to actually dial in a specific color temperature. So 3500, 6500, et cetera, et cetera. We can select it. And um, good lighting, good wash lighting, good even lighting will make your, your stream or your video recording look so much better. Um, basics on audio, try to think about having a separate mix. So I have the pastor's mic, I have potentially ambient mics in the room, maybe I've got uh, the music, maybe I'm doing uh, the music as well. Well, you'll see in some of the examples that I'll show you, a lot of churches do the music as well because they want to give the viewer the, the music part of the service too. I mean, in all reality, people come to your services not just for the message. They really enjoy the music, too. That's a big part of liturgy, and it's a big part of church, the church experience. So a lot of churches stream that as well. If you try to do that by using, say, the microphone on a camera in the back 50 feet away, <laughs> it's going to sound horrible. Okay? So consider doing a board mix. That could be an aux mix on your board. It could be doing a full mic split and having all of those channels go to a separate mixer. All of that can, can contribute to really good audio. Uh, another thing that you have to be really careful of is audio many times on certain recording devices, especially computer, will show up right away and then the video will kind of lag because of video processing and issues. Well, there's software and there's different uh, settings and different things that you can do with your equipment to time sync the audio and the video. And so I'll show you in my examples here, an example where the, the video is lagging behind the audio. And that's one of the biggest, even just a, a, a quarter of a millisecond, you can kind of see it. So, and then the role of compression. So what compression does is it takes those really high peaks out of the stream, out of the broadcast. It smooths out your audio so it doesn't go really loud at some point and then it gets really soft and, and it takes away those peaks so that you don't have um, inconsistency is probably the best word in your audio. Who am I watching? Uh, this is an example of a church's watermark. You can kind of see it on their broadcast. So this is their stream channel. You'll see, oops, you'll see up here a watermark of their, their church's logo and they put that on there, the name of the pastor 
and which service it is, the, the name of the message. And the other thing that's really exciting is if you see over here, they, they've got their schedule, but they also have a chat room that, that opens up during their live stream so people can chat and ask questions. And they have a person that sits there, and, you know, what church is this? I don't, I'm not aware of it. And the person can talk live. You can send them a, a, a prayer request right there in the bottom. You can share their stream on Facebook. All these different things are right there on their channel. And then this, this channel is actually a link on their website, and it goes to this. Um, so that's, that's basically it on, on the capture side of it. You know, getting good audio, having good lighting, and then um, bringing all those essential things together. Now I'm going to get into mixing, and this is an area where you can be very basic, which is the switcher in the upper left, which we actually have a demo of today. Uh, and, or you can s get very complicated, which is the switcher over here, <laughs> which Grant is sitting in front of. And you can look at this hardware when we're done. But what these are is they're basically taking in audio and video and mixing them and giving you transition effects like fades and wipes and things like that so that you can go between cameras. And some of them, from Roland especially, have built-in encoders even, so that you can plug in a USB cable and actually stream right out of it uh, to the internet. So it's pretty exciting, uh, some of the mixer technology. We many times specify mix mixers based on uh, how many cameras there are, how many sources. Most of the time, we're not just doing cameras as sources. We're also taking in like the the song, the songs, slides that are on the main screen, we're taking in perhaps uh, another computer or another titler that we can use the lower third. And I'll show you an example of that where we put up like the scripture verse or the name of the message or the name of the pastor, all that. That's called a key. Uh, luminance key is the most popular to use on these mixers. Uh, difference between a luminance and a chroma key. Has anyone not heard the term chroma key before? Okay, so chroma key is taking out a color. So if you think about the person doing the weather on the news and they stand in front of a green screen and there's no other green object on there but this green screen, what they do is they key out the green and then they put that backdrop with the, the weather map behind them. So that's called a chroma, chroma, chroma key. A luma key takes out black so that you can put in like white text to overlay on top of the image. So uh, camera technology, this is an area of hardware like switchers where there's a huge variance. Um, most of the time when we're working with clients and setting up streaming systems, we're, we're working with pan tilt cameras. So this one in the upper right is an example. Most clients don't buy full studio setup ENGs like you see in this lower left picture. Um, each one of these cameras in a, in a full studio broadcast ENG setup, now that we're in the world of HD, is $100,000 with a lens. So extremely expensive. Um, they're amazing. Uh, the pros of an ENG setup though is you'll never get the kind of movement on a studio camera that on a pan tilt you'll never do it you'll never get the smooth movement the the natural flow movement of a high quality tripod in a studio ENG camera it just does not exist on the pan tilt side of the world unless you're in the super high-end broadcast products that are used uh, on sets so um, Typically, these pan tilt video cameras range in the neighborhood of $2,000 to $6,000 is probably a good range right now, most of the time that we work with. And we rarely ever sell anymore the standard definition. And I'll get into the pros and cons of SD versus HD here in a second. But cameras are priced not just on, you know, whether they're pan tilt or they're tripod cameras, they're also priced 
based on the size of the CMOS chip, which is the chip inside of them that captures video, captures the light and the color. The larger the chip, usually the more expensive the camera is. And then the lens itself. Is it a 12x optical lens? Is it is an 18x optical? Is it a 20x optical? Just a, as a general rule of thumb, you never want to use digital zoom because what you're doing is you're taking the size of the chip and shrink, shrunkating into the chip and using a smaller part of the chip. And that's why if you try to use digital zoom, you'll notice it, it'll get really grainy because it's not using the full chip. Um, so SD versus HD, while it's true that you can still buy standard definition it's hard to find them, <laughs> but you can still find them. The reason that we don't specify them is not so much because we're needing to stream or record in high definition. It's more because the camera just looks so much better. Even if you have an HD camera that is, um, let's say it's a 1080p pan tilt camera like this one we have right here. Um, even though the camera has 1080p, if I take that 1080p and I use maybe 720 or convert it to 720 or use the 720 out on the camera, it still looks better than a standard definition camera because it's an HD camera. Even if I took that camera and went all the way down to 480 and did standard definition, because the chip is HD, because the lens is better, it just looks better. So we rarely, you know, I rarely never see anyone buying new SD equipment anymore. So even though many of them record and stream in standard definition, which is kind of interesting. More on that later. But um, the, the zoom ratio on, the, on a really good pan tilt camera, the ones we normally work with, is about 20 times to 1. 20x is what we call it. Uh, if you're setting up a pan tilt camera, in, like best position is in the middle and the back, of your sanctuary to get straight dead on on the altar or the, the platform, um, you really need a 20x lens because you're dealing with typically more than 50 feet, 50 feet or more typically, sometimes less. But um, the, 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 it's a lot less real estate. That's probably the biggest reason that people do it is because if you look at, if you go back, okay, if you look at this image here, Look at how much space these cameras take. Now you've got a person standing behind a camera. That may work in a big, huge mega church like this, but that does not the reality of most sanctuaries to take up that much space. So, you know, and then the other huge benefit is that the, the, the lack of volunteers is always a real problem um, at churches. And so thinking about someone that can mix video and run a pan tilt camera or cameras, three different, two or three different cameras at one time, that's a single operator versus having three different manned cameras, a director, a switcher, and all that, it just gets to be so much. So that's the pros and cons of those two. Um, one of the things too that, that a lot of churches I think struggle with is when they set up video production in general, is that it is like another position. So it's like lighting position. It's like a sound mixing position. It takes space. Um, just kind of showing you two, a couple different examples here. The one on the far left is a dedicated control room. There's huge benefits to that. Uh, first of all, you can mix sound with speakers. You don't need to wear headphones and um, you really have a controlled environment for, for doing video. It is a very expensive thing though, and it takes up obviously a lot of space. In the upper right, that's just an example of like a, a desk that's in a, probably a, a portable scenario even. But in the lower, the lower right there, you'll see, this is probably more typical to what most churches do and can do, and that is having the video position, having a lighting position, and then this is obviously graphics, and they probably have a, a mix console further down. But this is right here on the lower left is about how much space it takes. It takes an operator position typically to do video and to do recording. And um, you know, if all you do is one camera and you're recording to the camera, 
and hopefully again getting audio from your board and not using the, the mic on the camera it then it can take less space then you're talking about perhaps just a small tripod sitting on a desk but then again you have the disadvantage of having only one camera position and it doesn't look real good so this is maybe what not to do <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I was um, trolling around the internet looking at control room video control room pictures and I, I was like I've been there before. Wait a minute. I've been there like 50 times. Sorry. But a lot of people struggle with, you know, how do, how do I set this up? How do I design it? And that's where we come in. We do systems. So now I'm going to get into encoding. And encoding is a process of taking that video and audio and compressing it, which in this case would be for streaming. And a lot of people don't realize that you don't just um, compress video and audio when it comes to streaming. You also compress it when you're storing it, when you're recording it. There are different codecs and there's different compression methods. Currently, uh, most of the time what you're doing is you're encoding to H.264 and then there is the streaming services that, you know, one in particular that we'll recommend today that are serving it back to the viewer in either Flash or the new uh, Apple standard which is called HTL. HTL is taking over the entire um, market and we believe that we'll see no flash websites and no flash video within about 12 months. So big change in the market. Steve Jobs was right yet again. Um, so one of the things that when you set up a streaming system or a recording system with the internet is you can either use a computer to, to be your encoder and there's different software out there. There's one called Wirecast is probably the most popular or there's different programs that sometimes come with capture boxes that you can use and that's encoding it and recording it to the computer or streaming it to your uh, streaming provider or you can buy a dedicated encoder box appliance. We've had a lot more success with the dedicated encoder box appliances because they're built for it and they don't, they're not running Windows OS and they're not running Safari or whatever the Apple one is, Lion or whatever that OS is. And you typically run into a lot less issues. It doesn't mean that the computer method is bad or doesn't work all together it can work for sure and a lot of people do choose to go that route one of the biggest problems that I see though is when you're recording or you're using the computer as the stream appliance is I see a lot of video lag and that that issue we were talking about with the audio showing up before the video because the video is takes so much more to record that I see a lot a lot of times I see that problem showing up when the computer is being used as the encoder appliance. So um, there's a lot of file parameters when it comes to encoding, resolution that you're capturing the video at, the aspect ratio, the frame rate, data rate, bit rate, bandwidth, all these different things um, come into play. And we talked about that we have th this, these choices of live streaming archive channel or both which is great or uploading it to a service like Vimeo or YouTube and I'll go into the pros and cons of that in a second and then using a streaming service service versus an upload site like Vimeo or, or YouTube just a real quick side note on resolutions um, a lot of people really obsess now about HD and it's it's an area where I think there's too much time spent on it and not enough on the fundamental stuff like, you know, like great lighting, great audio, more than one camera, all those things sort of gets pushed aside in lieu of we got to have 4K resolution HD, you know, and that isn't really the case because if you think about it, people that are going to watch your stream or your archive channel are probably looking at a 7-inch iPad mini. So does it need to be, you know, super high definition not really most of the systems that we set up we optimize them for 720p because it's right in the middle uh, it takes less bandwidth and it still looks really good 
but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't suck up so much memory. Upload. So we've, we've captured it, we've encoded it, and now we're going to upload it, hopefully to worship channels, which is our preferred supplier for uh, streaming channels and live and archive streaming. And this is a, a slide that they gave me to work with to sort of understand what you need. So when, when you do decide to start moving in this direction, you're going to need to test your church's high-speed internet access speed. And what's important is not the download speed. Okay? It's the upload. All right. So you can go to this website called speedtest.net. It's free. You click on it and it's a begin test and you'll be able to tell. First it's going to do your download and then it'll do your upload speed. And these are the rules of thumb is typically what you need is a minimum of about two and a half megabits per second upload speed to do streaming. Okay, That's to the streaming provider. If you try to stream yourself, you need extremely expensive equipment and very, very fast internet speed. Almost no one does that. Only the really, really super big churches do that right now. So streaming providers provide bandwidth. They provide polling of devices and browsers. Does, do, do, have you ever heard that before, heard that term? Mr. Non-Technical, anyone else? <laughs> So what polling is, is the actual provider that is dishing up your stream or offering it, you know, you upload it to them, they spit it out. What they're doing is they're actually pinging the person watching its internet speed and their device, whether it's an iOS device or it's a, a Chrome browser or an Internet Explorer browser. It's actually pulling it and serving back the video and matching it to what you can take. A lot of people don't realize that YouTube automatically does that. So it's pretty incredible. Um, but having a, a dedicated streaming provider also gets rid of advertisements. So one analogy I heard was if you're going to use a free streaming site with you know, questionable advertisements next to it, like Budweiser and so forth. Why don't we just do church at the bar and have beer? What's the difference? <laughs> so it's a, it can be a real distraction having the ads, which is why I think you need a worship-based um, streaming provider. And then they a lot of these uh, church-based ones, like worship channels, they're optimized for the full full experience. They've got a click to donate tab, they've got prayer request tab uh, box, they've got uh, chat room, They've, they offer so many different value adds beyond just the live stream or the archive channel that it's pretty impressive. We talked a lot about, you know, capturing, uh, encoding, uploading. A couple other common questions. Why would I stream when I want people to attend in person? We talked about the 10% rule is why that ten, at any given moment, 10% of your people can't attend for some reason. Maybe they're at the cabin that weekend. You know, there's lots of different things. Um, why use a service like worship channels and not upload to a free stream site, Vimeo or YouTube? One of the things that I, I didn't think about and I was talking about with someone recently is we live in a really different world now from when a lot of us grew up. I mean, our pictures that we put on Facebook are no longer our pictures anymore. I'm, I still try to like understand that. <laughs> so when you put video on YouTube or when you upload it to YouTube or Vimeo, when you click agree to terms, it's right in there. It's no longer yours anymore. And uh, in fact, in YouTube's uh, terms, it's theirs for 70 years, it says. That's how long they can use it if they want. So, 70. Yeah. Yeah, so, pardon me? Yeah. Right. So, the other thing, the other thing that I wonder about 
especially when it comes to a live stream. Let's say that you were live streaming to a free live stream site that was secular based and something bad happened on the live stream and it's being auto archived on their servers. It's being auto recorded, which is what t most of them do. And you called them up and you said, I don't want that video going to the news outlets. Oh, I'm sorry, they just gave us, you know, a couple thousand dollars for it, so we gave it to them. By the way, do you remember on the terms when you clicked agree? Because it's a free site, it's our video now. So there's a lot of issues with that that come into play. So worship channels is a hundred dollars a month. You don't get that. It's you can control it then. So um, one of the big things that I think people struggle with when it comes to streaming and recording video in, in churches is that there's, there needs to be a vision from the top down of what do we want it to look like. So if you decide as a church, you know, hey, we're going to move slowly into it. We're going to start with one camera. Uh, maybe we do Vimeo to start just so that it's, you know, we've got some archives there. Maybe, maybe we don't do the live stream to start out. That's fine. Maybe you say, you know, we want to do this right the first time, so we're going to do uh, a full pan tilt video system with two to three cameras, and we're going to offer it not just for streaming or archive channel, but we're also going to send the video to other parts of the building, and we're going to offer recording of weddings for three to five hundred dollars a pop to people that get married in our church. All of this can happen, but that top-down vision of how you want to do it is very important. The pastor needs to be on board big time. Um, the other thing where I think people really struggle with is the whole volunteer aspect. And I asked um, Sean with Worship Channels, I said, what is the biggest challenge that churches face when it comes to streaming? And he goes, I can answer that right away. A, a, a volunteer, an operator that is knowledgeable. So it does take some time to learn the equipment, to operate it, to, to do this, but it's not super difficult. I don't think it's even close to as complicated as live sound mixing, not even remotely as difficult. So do you think at a minimum you need at least one volunteer, if not two, to do streaming and archiving? Um, probably not more than three. Q&A time. I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, please don't let it annoy you <laughs> for our recording. So. Ms. Fudd, do you have anything? You've had all the questions so far. <laughs> I have one question. Also. Sure. Um, it's a little complex question. Uh, you know, when we ask it to, in the church, you know, we want to broadcast or stream quality service. You know, the service is not video only. Right. Uh, but how we portray Jesus also. You know, how, in the message, how he's expressed. So some of the challenges that, like, uh, would it be taking attention from the message of Jesus and putting it on people? Like, who we give attention to? Like, when we video record, we want something nice, cool, you know, to be visible to everyone. Right. So there is a challenge of what is it we want to show. Like, we, right. ask it, we want to show something quality, but what yeah. is it? That's, that, that's a great point and question is, is how do we decide what parts of our service we want live stream to the world and there very well could be parts that you don't okay where you have to put up a splash logo and maybe it's just the audio at that point I think about baptisms as being one of those things okay because that decision really should be with the family you should say hey I understand your child's getting baptized we're gonna use our camera system to put the baptism up on the screens, which is another application for having a camera system. Oh, but by the way, we live stream our service. Do you care if your child's baptism is live streamed on the internet? I don't want my child on the internet. I could hear a mother saying that right away. So there certainly, I think, are going to be times that you don't want to, 
but I think it's a very important discussion that needs to happen with the leadership of the church, is to say, what in our service do we want, what, we, what do we not want, and how do we do it? So for example, let's just say that you wanted to offer weddings, um, which is a great way to sort of pay for the system. I always think that one of the neatest shots you can do is a shot, a, a pan tilt camera that's mounted on the, the altar slash stage wall facing the bride from behind. So you can actually see a close-up of the bride's face as they're getting married. That's a really neat thing. Um, that, would, that would be an example of how we can take a different shot and use it during a service in a positive way. So I think that you need to decide as a group, as a church, as a ministry, how should I, how and what should I show? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because when we are asked in you know, quality, we, right now I'm looking at in terms of the audio, the video, the right. quality only, but the, what is actually broadcast. Right. That's yeah, and, and that, that's a really good point because I always think what's funny about video systems in general, whether it's projection or uh, recording and so forth, equipment is equipment. It's not content, okay? And people will buy, like from us, for example, projection systems, and I'll start to ask them, how do you plan on using it? And I'll hear things like, well, you know, we're, we're, instead of buying $50,000 in hymnals, we're deciding to do projection now. We're going to stop buying hymnals. I'm like, great, what else? And they're like, what do you mean, what else? <laughs> I'm like, well, what about announcements? What about a live camera shot of a baptism on your screens in your space? What about video clips of summer camp? What about sermon notes? What about bullet points? What about scriptures? What about seasonal graphics? All these different things can be used because equipment is only giving you content. That's all equipment does at the end of the day is content is really the king. So that was a great question, Ms. Fain. Anything else? Any other questions? So ballpark, if you were going back to your pastor and saying, okay, at minimum, mm -hmm. it would be about this. I mean, granted, every church is different in terms of what they ha actually have on the site already. What's the high end and what's the low end yeah. of something like this? Yeah, great, great question. We do proposals all the time. We install streaming systems here and there. Last one we did um, was at a church in Mound called Good Shepherd, and uh, we installed the camera side of that and the streaming system switching. It had a projection system in the same mix, but I want to say it was around 30 to 35 grand in that ballpark range. That's just, that's just the video. Yeah, the, the, for what we're talking about, setting up a streaming system from scratch. Yeah, that, that would be, I would guess, probably in the middle of most clients that we work with. Well, that's including cameras. And yeah, projection. cameras and training and installation and wiring and all those different things, yeah. Terry? That's a system where you're uploading to the they, worship channel? Yeah, not, absolutely. Not live streaming. Live and archive, both. It can do both. Oh. Mm -hmm. I got a question well. regarding, was it worship channels? Worship that channels, yep. Service mm -hmm. um, do they also provide the archiving and a web interface for yes. your content. So in other words, if you have another website, you would link to that and that would... They provide basically a channel, which is their website, mm -hmm. your channel, specifically for you with your graphics and the setup you want. They provide you a login for admin so you can manage it. And they basically customize it to the way you want it. And they do a lot of setup stuff. That's where the real value is. is when, you set up, when you set up an encoder box, today when I work with clients, I don't even have my guys set it up. I just have them call worship channels and they'll dial right into it with an IP address and set it up. Bit rates, frame rates, all those different things. Because they're looking at it from their receive end. They're polling. They can tell what they need right. to serve it back. So they're going to be the best to optimize it. That's probably the biggest value. From a, um, I'm, I'm going to go in the weeds here a little mm -hmm. bit on the technical side. Sorry. That's, that's fine. Um, with an encoder, uh, mm -hmm. obviously I am a very strong proponent of hardware encoders as well. Right. 
Um, versus computer. Versus computer. So, the, right. yeah. Very, very strong. Right. I've seen way too many other things. Yep. But anyway, that aside, um, what is the recommended installation for one of those? Because most sites, you know, like our church, we've got a router sitting there. Right. Is this something that you would put out in front of the router or back behind it? Behind it. DMZ poke through it with specific IP addresses for like yeah. membership channels yep. to get through and nobody else? Yeah, exactly. That kind of thing? Yep. Okay. You, you provide them a, a, DMZ. A, a DMZ to get through your firewall to your, and then th that box has an IP address. And then they have full access to optimize it and troubleshoot it if there's a problem. So it's, it's incredible um, how much easier that makes everything. Back before there was, you know, affordable encoding boxes, we were using that um, Wirecast software a lot on computers and just pulling what hair we had left out. I'm like, how do we get this flaming thing to work? You know, and it, so many times it was, well, the codec on your video card isn't compatible or the firmware isn't up to date in Windows, you know, all these different issues, you know what I mean? All these different issues come into play when you introduce the computer into it versus having a dedicated appliance that, by the way, is made to do that. It's the whole reason it was designed. So great, great point about encoder boxes. Yeah. Terry? It's a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it includes the archive channel. So what he typically does is he provides a button on your home page. I'm sorry, on your website, uh, your church live, and then your church archive. And you can format it in different ways. So you can also pull down the video on the admin page, and you can do what you want with it. Make DVDs, things like that. You'd have to rip them down in resolution, but you can. So, so they provide a button that... Link that basically links. Links, an, links another browser that would pop up for somebody else to yep. go to so they would actually leave your website, but they people could start at your website and then go to mm -hmm. this channel and yep. pull it. Yeah. And it, it the channel's hosted at worship channels. Yeah, it, it uh and again because of the polling technology, that's why that's so important because all these different devices are it's crazy. Even different browser versions. Browser so versions. Yeah. Well, and if you're yeah. From an iPad or if you're from a computer right. Or and the reason that I know that, is to me, it makes all the sense in the world why HTL is going to take over and Flash is going to go away, because video now, whether it's Netflix, Hulu, all these different things, they have to standardize because otherwise it's, it'll never work. So because there's so many, like you say, different browsers. Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Safari, all these different things. So they have to standardize on something that's going to work. So, so, again, you know, it comes to propeller head stuff, mm -hmm. getting in the weeds a little bit. So they're still using the 264 codec. It's just the, they're not using H323 or SIP or something like that. It's HTL that does all of the session setup and maintenance. Right. With the 264 stream happening. That's that. what happens with their servers when they stream it back. Okay. Yeah. They're, okay. they're doing HTL now because of, the, that makes sense. because of the standardization that needed to happen for a long time. Because the Flash thing has been fighting with Apple for a long, long time. And they're, uh, they're going to lose. Horrible. So, yeah. Um, great questions. Any other questions? Okay, Ms. Yeah, when testing this uh, live stream, mm -hmm. do we want to be on the same network where it's broadcast from, or we want to ask somebody else from outside of the, that network? For testing? For testing, yeah. Because I really think it's super valuable to have someone monitoring, monitoring it off-site, um, not in your building, <laughs> you know, that's maybe it's just your some a relative hey how's it look a quick text how's it look um, because I've done it before and I've noticed that it's it can be so different than if you try to monitor it within the building but people do it both I've seen it done both ways you can actually so. do it on your phone as long as you're not on the Wi-Fi network right that's true yeah. if you use cellular data you could do it on your phone yeah and you can test the different speeds that you're going to mm -hmm. get off, off campus and right I think probably the biggest thing with, with what Brad's talking about is I think the biggest need is that when you set up streaming in general, 
you have to optimize it for the setup that you've got, the resolution, the audio, all these different things, they need to be optimized. So um, one thing before we end today, I just wanna, uh, for, again, thank you for coming, but also uh, take some time to look at this amazing hardware that our Roland rep Paul brought. We've got a couple different, actually three different video switchers here. We've got some different video appliances. We also have a PTZ Optics and a camera controller if you'd like to get your hand on it and feel um, camera control, what that looks like, what it looks like on the screen. Go ahead and spend some time with the, with the gear. And then don't, before you leave, don't um, miss a chance to go up to the sanctuary the far away, uh, that way on the uh, far south side of the building and you'll see the big video wall and take a look at that before you leave. And then, you know, please contact us if you'd like a system quote of anything, whether it's video streaming system, uh, we can do a, a proposal for you that for that. Uh, sound system upgrades and lighting, we do all of it. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>